Well, you in for a long sermon or a short sermon tonight? Who votes, who votes short? Five minutes or less is short. Who votes that? Okay, I hear you. I hear you. Who, who, says, who says somewhere in the middle? That's, that's kind of up for grabs, whatever that means. Who thinks long is just okay, you're in for the long haul? Look at this. I think, I think the, long, the longs have it. I think the longs have it. Pastor, pastor, you don't have the microphone. <laughs> now, I hear you say you're the boss. You don't have the boss ball at the moment. Hey, next, next Sunday night, we have water baptism and baby dedication night. I hope that you'll be here. Uh, and then the Sunday nights following that, we're going to be doing a series called Surviving the Holidays. How many of you know that the holidays come with a whole baggage of stuff? All right? So it's going to be a, it's going to be a great series. And uh, the Sunday nights beginning the 11th, 11th, 18th, and then the first two Sundays of December, there's going to be a Sunday in there where we have a missionary uh, and uh, so you're in for a treat for Sunday nights. And I encourage you to invite someone uh, to come with you and join, join you on those Sunday nights. It will be a tremendous time. We actually have an ad in the Urbandale Living um, magazine for this series. And so we're hoping that it appeals to people that would just come. Because the holidays have a whole lot of things attached to it. A lot of emotions and just feelings, you know, around holiday times. And so... We are, we are wanting the gospel to go forward, so encourage you to uh, do that. And then on the front of your bulletin, it says Thankful 30. How many of you have seen that? Wondering what that is. It begins on the first. And so we're going to have a series the next uh, three Sunday mornings in uh, November on thankfulness. Pastor Weaver is going to kick off that series next Sunday. But here's what we want you to do. Uh, we want you to take the whole month of November. There's 30 days in November. And uh, not just give thanks, we want you to do that, but this is like no negative, no negative out of your mouth. Isn't that kind of how we're doing it, Pastor? We're asking all who will, who will say no negative, nothing critical coming out of my mouth. So, uh, grab your tongue, work on this. I had a conversation with my daughter, Brianna. We were talking about this last night, and she was like, that means I can't complain about blah, blah. <laughs> and I said, no, that's the way it is. It's going to have to be that way, and that's the way our house is going to be. And I'm not saying we're not going to be, we're, we're all going to be perfect in that, but we're never going to get there if we don't try. How many of you know, it's, I, we probably complain a whole lot more than we should. There's a whole lot of negative things that can come out of our mouth that should not be how much better people around us would be if our words were encouraging and not discouraging. So uh, how many of you are up for taking that challenge? All of you that say long sermon ought to have your hands up, okay? <laughs> this is all an endurance here, okay? Um, but let's, let's take that challenge. And uh, that starts on the first, which is Thursday this week, all right? Thursday this week. Okay, now to the business at hand. Uh, Upside Down Kingdom. A couple of weeks ago, I preached a, a message, and uh, this was going to be a three-part series, so I, I, you thought I was joking, but I'm taking two sermons and packing them into one. Actually, I'm taking about five sermons and putting them into one tonight. You just thought I was trying to get some attention, Pastor. It's the truth. All right. I'll go fast. But a couple Sunday nights ago, Upside Down Kingdom, uh, we know that we live in a world where right is wrong and wrong is right, good is bad, bad is good. We live in a world that is totally upside down. And we looked at this passage of scripture, Dr. Nunley shared it this morning, Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, where Jesus said, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Unless you become like little children, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. And I apologize. I don't know how to operate that media thing back there, so we're going old school. I got a picture for you to look at. You're going to have to write the verses down, okay? Go back and study. Listen, pay attention. 
Uh, but Matthew 18, 3, that's what Jesus said. Unless we become like little children. And obviously we realized last week, we're not talking about the, the, the little children aspect of, you know, drooling and thumb sucking and diaper wearing and crawling and that type of thing. We're not talking about the external characteristics of a child, but the internal nature. And so when we think of uh, the nature of a child, we think of innocence. But, you know, as time goes on and life goes on, we tend to lose a little bit of that innocence. We've become a little bit too wise, world-wise, a little bit out of that innocent box. So it's hard for us to go back to that innocence, but what Jesus was talking about, and Dr. Nunley referred to this morning, what Jesus was referring to is the dependency of a child. Unless we, unless we become like a child being dependent, we need to learn to be dependent on God for everything. And since I uh, uh, used Brianna, uh, told you about our conversation last time, I'm gonna use her again. So as I'm looking at her, I'm just remembering this. And you know, when you have little children or you've got grandchildren, what, is, what does this mean? Okay, and how many of you would look at a child who has their hands up? You're gonna say, no, I'm not picking you up. What are you thinking? Why, why do you, this is, this is Brianna, so I've got this picture in my mind of Brianna, a little two-year-old Brianna learning how to talk, going, Daddy needs you, needs you, and doing this. It almost brings tears to my eyes. Of course I'm picking her up. She needs me. I don't need her to need me, but she, needs, she is totally dependent. Any little child is completely dependent on somebody else. They can't, they can't provide for themselves. They can't cook for themselves. We have to teach them all these things. It takes time, and they're totally, totally dependent. Here's the other phrase that she used to say. She had tried something. She, Daddy, I can't know how. I can't know how. <laughs> and honestly, there's plenty of times where we ought to come to God with that kind of, that kind of word. God, I can't, I can't know how to do this. I can't know how. I can't do it. And it's an okay thing to tell God, I can't. I don't know how. Guess who can? Guess who knows how? Our daddy. God knows everything that we have need of. God knows how to provide for that need. He is an incredible father. And he will never turn us away. And what he's saying here, Jesus is saying, is we need to be totally dependent. We need to come to him like this. God, I need you. We need time with our Father. Childlike humility, putting our complete trust in God. There's some practical ways that we depend on God, and a couple of weeks ago, I never really got that far. I just got to the point of saying that we need to be dependent. And it's a simple, simple word, but I don't know if you've even thought of that since then, but that, is, that should be enough for us to say uh, we need to be dependent on God. But some practical things, I'm gonna go through these real quick. And um, this is part of the condensing five sermons into one. Um, It sounds like a Sunday school answer, but pray. Prayer is a way for us to depend on God. Acknowledging God's power, his promises, his provision in our life shows our dependence on him. Prayer. Coming to God in prayer. The word of God. That's a way for us to be dependent on him. The word of God. This, this book has information. It has instruction. It has examples. It has promises in it. We need to read from this book every day. We need to believe what it says is true. And what we don't, what, what we don't know, we can ask God. If any of us lacks wisdom, what do we do? Ask God, who gives wisdom liberally to all of us without finding fault. So pray, read your Bible. It sounds like Sunday school answers, but it's the absolute truth. If we're going to express our dependence in practical ways, how we can depend on God alone, that's it. Number three is do right. Do right. At all times, in all situations, there is a right way to act. And honestly, speaking life and truth and not complaining, that's a way of being doing right. So it may not seem easy, but do what you know is right. 
and just leave the results to God. Think about this. Think about a few people. Daniel. Daniel defied the king's order and continued to pray. David stood up to Goliath. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And in each of those cases, their dependence on God was rewarded. Think about it. Do the right thing all the time in every situation. Abide in Christ. What does it mean to abide in him? See, the, our Christian life isn't uh, now and then a uh, little rendezvous type thing with God. It's making God our dwelling place. It's living with him all the time. Jesus put it this way in John 15. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. We need to depend on Jesus. That branch has to be connected to the vine if it's going to do anything. We need to abide in Christ. And number five, and this is tough for a lot of people, but it's true, refuse to worry. If we're going to depend on Christ, we need to refuse to worry. We worry about a lot of things, but here's what I know about God. And here's what I think you know about God. God cares about you. God cares for you. How many think God cares? I, sh lots of show of hands tonight. If you think God cares, raise your hand. Anybody think that God doesn't care? Why do we worry? Why do we worry? Jesus said he takes care of the, f the flowers in the field, the birds in the air. We're told to cast our anxiety, our cares, our worry on him because he cares for us. So keeping any of that anxiety, keeping any of that worry to ourselves, onto ourselves, is really doubting God. If we refuse to give that to him, then what we're saying is, I don't think you can. If we believe that God cares, let's give our care to him and let him care for us. So there's some practical ways to depend on God. In this upside down kingdom, becoming like children is really the beginning for us to be able to live in a dependence on God. We've got this upside down kingdom, and there's a lot that the scriptures say about an upside down kingdom and how things ought to be. Hard for us to listen to that and do what it says or live by that. But Jesus said a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense to us, that seem really, really upside down. Like the first will be last, and the last will be first. Matthew 19, 30, but many who are the greatest now will be the least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. And that's contained in the story of the rich, of the rich man. We put a lot of importance on wealth, popularity, athleticism, beauty. Those are the people that we hold up as somebodies. Jesus said, you know what, there's going to come a day when the last will be first and the first will be last. I had this problem last time and I'm, Ron, what do I need to do? Back. Thanks, Gary. Shifting. Everybody lean this way. It'll help my microphone a whole lot. Not really. Um, also said in Matthew 20, 16, so those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. It was, that's the story of the, of the workers in the vineyard. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't make sense. The people that showed up right at the end of the workday, you know, there were people that started the workday, and they got a certain amount of money. Then there was people that showed up at the end of the workday, and he paid them the same amount of money. And, and I'm sure in our minds, we'd look at that and say, well, that, how is that fair? I worked a full eight hours. This guy showed up and worked a half hour, and we got the same thing. The first will be last. The last will be first. It's an upside-down world, but Jesus said it. That's the, way it. that's the way it is. The way for us to win is to lose. Losing 
is really finding. Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 16, 24, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? To find our lives, we have to lose it for Christ's sake. We hold on to our lives, we lose it. Proverbs chapter 14, 12 says, there's a way that appears to be right. There's a way that seems right to man. Where does that lead? If it makes sense to you, I'm not saying it always is going to lead that way, but if it makes, there's a way that seems right to a man and it always leads to death or destruction. Another phrase in this upside down kingdom is to be wise, what do you have to be? If you're going to be wise, you've got to become a fool. 1 Corinthians 3.18, stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by the world's standards, you need to become a fool in order to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. There's a way that seems right, but it leads to destruction. The way to become wise is to be a fool. 1 Corinthians 1.27, instead God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. He chose the things that are powerless to shame those that are powerful. God chose things despised by the world things counted as nothing at all, and use them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. All throughout Scripture, who did God use? The least. The ones that didn't have a great resume. The guys like Moses who finally would say to God, God, just choose somebody else, please. I can't do this, I can't do that. Gideon, who says, I'm the least of the least. And God even went a step further and and used Gideon with an army of 300 men to defeat tens of thousands. That's the stories we read in the Bible over and over. Those are real people. Those are real things that happened. Look at me. Look at me. I don't deserve this. I didn't earn this. To be here standing in front of you doing this, there was a time where I would have said you would be absolutely nuts to think I would ever do that. And I'm the one that told God, just choose somebody else, please, for months and months. That was the argument I had with God. Please, God, just, you don't know what you're doing here. This is, this makes no sense at all. Please, just choose somebody else. I can't talk. I don't, I don't want to talk. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to care about people. I just do my own little thing. God changes us. Isaiah, my thoughts, says, my thoughts are not like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So when God doesn't make sense, probably a pretty good thing. We should trust him. We wait till it makes sense to us before we move. But if we understand God and his perspective and his ability, he chose foolish things to confound the wise. He chose weak things to confound those who are strong. We need to listen to him. God's ways are so beyond our ways. One of the other things that we read in scripture is that when you're weak, that's when you're strong. It's when we're weak, that's when we're truly, truly strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about this. He said, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away and each time he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Does that make sense to you? God says, my grace is sufficient My grace is all that you need. God, please just remove this thing, this whatever it is. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's some kind of condition. 
And we say, God, if you could just get me out of this situation, if you could just remove this, everything will be good for me. And he's saying, I think, I think you're better off with that thing. I think you're better off with that person. I think you're better off working through this. I have plenty of grace. I'll pour my grace on you. It's all that you need. It's an opportunity for us to receive God's grace. When we're weak, that's when we're strong. Paul came to this conclusion, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am truly strong. It's an upside-down world. It's an upside-down kingdom that we're living in. One that I want to just spend a, a, a few minutes of time here at the end is something that Dr. Nunley referred to this morning, and that's this statement, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. If you want to be exalted, you've got to humble yourself. You go to the story about the banquet, and I think Dr. Nunley referred to this this morning, but you choose one of those um, important seats at a banquet table. And, and Jesus used this parable to say, don't, don't take the choice seats. Because what's going to happen is you're going to choose one of those seats. You walk in, nobody's sitting at the banquet table, and you're going to choose one at the head of the table. And what happens when the, the, the person who's given the banquet walks in and says, oh, uh, sorry, you're in the wrong seat. And in front of everybody he says, come here, I've got a place for you right at the end of the table. It's called humility. It's called being humiliated. He said, instead of being humiliated, just go set yourself at the end of the table, at the bottom end of the table. And then when the person given the banquet comes in and says, oh, what are you doing all the way down there in front of everybody? He'll say, come on up here and sit with me. If we exalt ourselves, we're going to be humiliated. But if we humble ourselves, that's when we will be exalted. How many of you remember the singer Mac Davis? This crowd, there's got to be at least as many hands as want me to preach long. Mac Davis, oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. It is when you're perfect, when you're perfect in every way. We got some perfect people in here? No. You probably heard about the guy who won an award for humility, but he had it taken away because he displayed it on the wall of his office. There was this uh, preacher who went on a vacation out west with his wife, and they came to one of these places where they have these echo canyons, and the sign uh, said that any loud yell would bounce off a distant ridge and come back in an echo. So he was a, a little bit skeptical about this, so he thought he'd, he'd give it a try, and he says, baloney! And a few seconds later, came back a, a faint, baloney! thought, that's... It's pretty cool. So he tried it one more time and he said, baloney! A couple seconds later, sure enough, came back and said, baloney! Or however it sounded. <laughs> His pride got the best of him and he thought, I'm going to yell this. He yelled out, I'm the greatest preacher in the whole world! And he waited. And he waited. And guess what he heard? Baloney. <laughs> it's better to humble ourselves than be humiliated. After the death of Adolf Hitler, the Gestapo chief, Heinrich Himmler, he was the most hunted man in Germany. Himmler and his two adjutants did their best to secretly fade into obscurity. They disguised themselves as members of the secret police. Himmler shaved his mustache, he wore an eye patch, but it was his pride that did him in. He could not bear to see himself wearing the uniform of a private, so he chose the rank sergeant. The instructions given by Allied forces were to arrest all members of the secret field police, beginning with the rank of sergeant. If it wasn't for his pride, he might have escaped, but he couldn't bear the thought of only being a private. You know, it takes a special person 
to humble themselves. Actually, it doesn't take a special person. It takes a person who is dependent on God. If we will just depend on God and put ourselves in that place, guess what? The Bible says that if we humble ourselves, guess what will happen to us? He will exalt us. John the Baptist is the one who said, he must increase and I must decrease. There has to be more of Christ and less of me. That's humility. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Humility isn't, isn't pushing others downward or pushing them backward. Humility is forgetting ourselves and pushing other people upward or forward. Consider others before ourselves. Think about others instead of ourselves. There's a man named Barnabas in scripture. You've heard of him? Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement. Barnabas didn't mind being second place. Barnabas was the one who played second fiddle. He was a team player. Barnabas risked his life for a man named Saul. He met him, heard his testimony, and he's the one that brought him to the apostles. Barnabas believed in Saul, believed in his conversion, believed that God had something for him and had a potential ministry. He saw that in a few other people too. That was Barnabas. So Barnabas, of course, Saul was, became Paul and they teamed up and had some missionary journeys. You remember that? Barnabas was the guy, remember, he was the guy that was in the lead. He's the one that took Paul to the apostles. Well, in short order, it seems like Paul was in charge. Because how do, we, how do we think of them? Barnabas and Paul or Paul and Barnabas, right? Paul was the one who became in charge and it seemed like Barnabas just went along, never seemed to complain about being second place. He knew about humility. And another word that we can use for humility is harmony. Think about that. He was perfectly happy to promote others ahead of himself, to cheer them on. Leonard Bernstein, famous orchestra conductor, was asked this question, what is the most difficult instrument in the orchestra to play? You've probably heard this before. What instrument did he say was the most difficult instrument to play? Second fiddle. He said, I can get plenty of first violinists but it's hard to find one who will play second violin with enthusiasm or second French horn or second flute. He said, that's a problem because if no one plays second, we have no harmony. F.B. Meyer, who is a famous theologian in the 19th century, said this. He said, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves one above another, and the taller we grow, the easier we can reach them. And now I find that God's gifts are on shelves one beneath another. And the lower we stoop, the more we get. It's what we need to do. We need to humble ourselves. We need to become dependent on God, completely dependent on him. It's a natural human nature thing for us to want to make a name for ourselves. How many of you have ever been on TV? You ever told people about that? Hey, I was on TV. Hey, I'm on TV tonight. Like, that's, that's something special. I was on CNN. I was on the NBC Nightly News. How many of you saw me on that? Nobody? Come on. I was on, the, Pastor Weaver and I were on, and Zach, we were on the Nightly News, NBC Nightly News. You don't remember that? That was our famous moment. Where are you people? Where were you? I'm serious. Were you not there? We were talking about the election. You don't remember that? I remember it. I was famous that day. Where did that get me? Nowhere. I did have someone from high school message me on Facebook saying, hey, I saw you on the NBC Nightly News. My one moment in glory. Obviously faded away, but you know that there, there's something about us. We want to make a name for ourselves. We want we want to see our names in lights. We we if we're honest, you know, we we want to be significant. We want to do something great. We we look to movie stars, to musicians, to 
um, athletes. Those are the ones that capture our attention. Those are the ones that our kids like look up to as heroes. They admire them. They want to aspire to be like them because, you know, they stand out. We may even want that not only for ourselves, we may want that for our children or other people. We want them to become somebody important, somebody significant. But the Bible teaches something quite opposite of of that. Turn to Genesis chapter 11. And believe it or not, I'm about to wrap up. It didn't turn out to be a long sermon anyway. Well, kind of, kind of long. Is that okay, all you long sermon people? Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. And they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. What does your version say next? Mine says, this will make us famous. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united. They all speak the same language. And after this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. And you know, that's, you know, God looked at these people this Tower of Babel that they were, they were wanting to make a name for themselves. They were all about making a name for themselves and becoming famous so people will talk about us, people will look at us, people will say, those people, they're the one. Those are famous people. At first it seemed innocent. They just wanted to make bricks and build a city, but then it got a little questionable because they built a tower that they wanted it to reach to heaven, and then really became very, very independent, self-sufficient. They didn't need God. We can make a name for ourselves. Make a name for myself. It seemed good and right in their eyes, but it completely disregarded God. Genesis chapter three, six, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end, it leads to death and destruction. So there are those who want to make a name for themselves. The other side of that coin is, we just want to make a name that's great. After the flood, Abraham's the first person mentioned that called on the name of the Lord. Abraham was a man who worshiped God. Abraham believed God. Abraham obeyed God. He had a heart for God. And James tells us that God declared Abraham to be righteous, and he was called the friend of God. Abraham set an example. Abraham was a man who walked in humility. He walked in the footsteps of of his master. God said, I want you to go here, and he just immediately packed up and went. Didn't even know where he was going. He trusted God. He believed God. He was obedient to God. He didn't seek his own glory. He humbly walked before God. Abraham sought to magnify God, his creator. Are we doing that? In our life, are we walking in humility before the Lord? Are we seeking to glorify him, or are we trying to glorify ourselves? We need to realize that in reality, we're nothing. We're nothing without God, but we're everything with him. 
We're nothing without God. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses or forfeits his own soul? In the end, God exalts the humble. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord. And what will he do? Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. He will raise you up. James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Another way of saying that is that we need to admit our dependence on God. Musicians can come, and I, I want us just to respond uh, this evening in a, in, a, in a way that would display humility. And I understand not everybody can do this, but I feel like the Lord just said, this is, how I want you to, this is how I want you to end. If you can tonight, I want us to end by just taking a few minutes, a couple minutes, five minutes. If you can, I'd like for you to find a place where you can kneel down. I know that not everybody can do that. But if you can't physically get on the floor and kneel down, would you... Would you posture yourself in such a way of humbling yourself before the Lord tonight? I want to invite you to stand. And I want, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask this question tonight in case there's someone here that needs to respond to salvation. God gave us a free gift of life, eternal life. Jesus gave his life. He humbled himself, became obedient to a cross, all for the purpose of helping you. And the right way to respond to that is saying, Jesus, I need you. With God, without God, we're nothing. With him, we're everything. And tonight, you're you're without God. You're walking without God in your life. If that's the case, would you respond and offer your life to him? Invite him into your life to walk with you because with him we're everything. If that's you tonight, you're here and you're saying, I'm, I'm not with God. And you would just respond by raising your hand saying, I need, I need him tonight. Anybody? I'm going to pray, and then I would like to ask that we just end tonight by finding a place where you can kneel before him and humble yourself before him. If you can't kneel, maybe it's just leaning over the pew where you're at. But I encourage you to find some place, either turn in your pew or come and find a place here at the front and just spend a few minutes. And if you just say nothing more than, Jesus, I need you. I need you. I need you, Daddy. I thank you, God, that you exalt those who humble themselves before you. We realize that, God, this is your world. You make the rules. This is, we're your creation, and you designed us with a plan and for a purpose. And some of the things that we read in Scripture seem to be so upside down. It seems so difficult for us to understand or to practice it, but I believe you put it there for a reason, and there's a way that you want us to live. You want us to walk humbly before you, to walk humbly with our neighbors and our families. You want us to prefer one another, to serve one another, to honor one another, to think of others before we think of ourselves. I pray that we'd walk that out in this upside down world that that we live in that needs to be turned right side up. Help us, God, to live right side up kind of lives according to your word and your plan and tonight God we just want to humble ourselves before you and ask God that you would fill us meet us help us guide us lead us use us work through us make us who you want us to be In Jesus' name. Tonight, just find a place where you can kneel, where you can bow. Spend a few minutes with the Lord. 
when you're done, you can, you can be dismissed. But let's just make this a place of seeking after the Lord and humbling ourselves in his presence.